Greetings everyone. Today we will be seeing an interesting ECG that has its own really clinical importance as well as the management decisions. So we'll see the case. So it's a 54 year old gentleman known case of seizure disorder who presented to us with Disney on exertion functional class three. So he's an NVHA class three physical examination showed in LVS3. So all of this is saying that this patient is having a some sort of heart failure. Probably this patient is having a systolic dysfunction because of the presence of the S3 that this patient has. Murmurs, anything, were not found in this patient. So how is the ECG helping us? So if you see here, this is at admission ECG. So what are the things that are there in this ECG? And what are the things that have to uh, we have to look for carefully. So first is we make sure that the technical details are fine. So standardization is normal. So it's a sinus rhythm. So AVR is uh, good. So P wave is negative here, positive. AVR, this is probably because of a branch block that is there here. We'll come to that. But uh, P being negative. So uh, this is fairly good. So it's a normal sinus rhythm. So then we'll come to what exactly is happening to the rhythm here. So if you see there is a P wave. There is another P wave here and there is a QRS here. So this pattern is repeating. So there are two P waves and there is one QRS complex. This pattern continuously repeats. So this means that there is a two is to one block. So for every two, v, two P waves, there is one QRS complex. So the, the we call it as a conduction, AV conduction. This AV conduction is two is to one. There is 2 is to 1 AV conduction. Apart from that, what else is there in this patient? So apart from that, uh, if you see the axis, so there is a left axis deviation. So we have a left axis deviation. If you see the intervals, PR is mildly prolonged and the QRS is also prolonged. So this becomes important. So whenever there is an AV block, so whenever there is a 2 is to 1 AV block, this means that it is uh, some sort of an advanced degree of block because for every two P waves, only one is being conducted. So whenever this is there, we have to look at the QRS, whether it is narrow or wide. This will tell us if we take this to be as the AV node, so we can divide it into supra portion and infra portion. Any block that happens at the infra level means that it is going to be a severe conduction uh, defect and uh, this will require an emergency pa permanent pacemaker insertion. So that is what it is going to tell us. So here, if you see the QRS appears a little wide, so that's why I've uh, written it here. And uh, the PR interval is also mildly prolonged. So there is a two is to an AV block. There's a left axis deviation. We'll come to this left axis deviation. So pathological left axis because lead two is also negative. Um, so there is mild PR prolongation of the QRS. So there is infra ICN block that is there. Apart from that, what else is there? So if you see the STT changes. So if we see here, there is an R wave, there is an S wave and an R prime wave. So whenever we have an RS R dash, so RS R dash, it means that there is a right bundle branch block. Usually this is what is taught. Um, but this RS R dash, for calling it an RBBB, there should be an additional wide S wave in lead one AVL or in V6. So is it there? Let's see. So there is no S wave here. There is no S wave here. There is no S wave. The small S wave, but it doesn't look like the RBBB S wave. So that is not there. So can we still call it RBBB? We'll come to this. Okay. Apart from that, one thing that is against the RBBB is just left axis deviation. Again, this left axis deviation. So very easy to call it as RBBB plus a left axis means we usually associate with a left anterior fascicular block. But Patient with severe LVH can also have uh, a left axis deviation. So that is why this becomes important. So the SN lead 3 is usually more than the SN lead 2. So we'll see the vectors uh, very shortly, how this happens. So this also becomes important criteria to call it as a uh, left anterior fascicular block. Left anterior fascicular block. So you have a pattern like this, an RS in the inferior leads and a nice R wave in the lateral leads, one in AVL. So this is a criteria to call it a left anterior fascicular block. 
so essentially it is like the entire conduction system so you have the right bundle the anterior fascicle the posterior fascicle the right bundle the av node so the av node is diseased the anterior fascicle is diseased the right bundle is diseased so only thing left is conduction to the posterior fascicle um, so this is the severity of the block that is there okay so this is what is there so just one week back what of the cc so similar findings are there but this is a normal sinus rhythm so there is one is to one av conduction for every one p wave there is one qrs complex one p wave one qrs complex one p wave one qrs one p wave one qrs so this is normal one is to one but in this patient it has become in just a matter of one week it has become two is to one okay so the importance is in this so one week back itself this ecg was a predictor of an impending do whenever we see this uh, kind of a pattern this means that the patient will just go down very soon so here also the same there is no p no s wave in one and avl again and then this criteria for uh, for left anterior fascicular block is again met so but here it appears like an rbbb here it does not appear like an rbbb this other looks like an lbbb okay so a combination of an lbbb in the precordial leads and in the limb leads you have an lbbb like pattern this is what is called as masquerading bundle batch block this is what our patient has so this is what we have seen so normal rbbb when you see so you get a very good s wave so this is what we were telling the s wave the s wave has to be there and there is something called as a rule of appropriate discordance so whenever we have a bundle branch block so the st segment and the t wave will be in the direction opposite to the qrs complex so in lead v1 if we take there is a positive deflection so this is the r wave so you are going to get a st depression with the t wave inversion you see whereas in lead v6 so you have an s wave here so you are going to get a positive deflection positive t wave and a positive st segment so this is normal so this is normal for any bundle back block right bundle or a left bundle this will fulfill this criteria if this is lost that is a marker of ischemia so if there is no rule of appropriate discordance that means there is ischemia so in this patient uh, so normal rbbb appears like this and the axis is usually normal axis so here if you see there is an rbbb morphology but the axis is left axis but s in lead 3 more than lead 2 so all of this is saying that there is a bifascicular block so this is right bundle branch block plus a left anterior fascicular block but even in this if you see the s wave is preserved the s wave is preserved so this is the key important message to note the s wave is preserved so this is one important thing that you uh, notice so why this happens is uh, when our the anterior fascicular is blocked impulse is conducted away from lead 3 so lead 3 will show the maximum deflection because the impulse is going away from lead 3 so the negative deflection will be maximum in lead 3 compared to lead 2 so if this is the direction of movement so you are going to get lead 3 that is going to be here so lead 3 will have maximum deflection okay and uh, simultaneously here because this is the direction of the current so avl will show maximum positive deflection and lead 3 will show the maximum negative deflection so this is a combination called as masquerading bundle batch block masquerading means there is something hiding so what is hiding is these patients underlying they have an underlying lbbb or a very advanced left anterior anterior fascicular block so it means that the entire left sided conduction system itself is diseased but superficially when you look it appears like an rbbb on the ecg so if you see here it appears like an rbbb so you just say okay rs r dash this is rbbb but is it rbbb this is not there this is not there sf is not present so two types have been described way back in 1954 but uh, it has not been uh, spread enough so the knowledge of this has not been uh, popularized much so there are two types one is called as a standard type and precordial type in standard type Uh, the precordial leads v1 to v6 appear like an rbbb morphology whereas limb leads in uh, one and avl they appear like lbbb so this is what is the standard type in precordial type you should be even more careful 
wherein uh, leads V4 to V6 appear like an LBBB and V1 to V3 appear like an RBB. Okay. Why is this important? Because this associated with independently associated with higher mortality. Higher progression. If you take patients with right, right bundle branch block and a left antiphasic blood block, we call it as a bifascicular block versus a masquerading bundle branch block. This masquerading bundle branch block is more severe and 59% of them independently went into developing complete heart block within one year. So even if these patients are asymptomatic, it underlies the importance for the requirement of permanent pacemaker insertion. Okay, so this is the importance of this. Also, apart from that, there is something called as a cardiac resynchronization therapy. As the heart failure worsens in any patient, so the LV and RV, they're not going to contract synchronously. So there are going to be interventricular desynchrony and intraventricular desynchrony. Okay, so to bridge this, what they do is they take one uh, lead here and one lead in the RV. Simultaneously, they make them contract so that there is resynchronization that happens. This CRT works best for patients who have an LBBB morphology. So the surface 12 lead ECG should have a good LBBB morphology with a QRS more than 150 or 130 to 149. If it is less than 130, again, it is not done. Okay. Um, so if there is a patient with masquerading bundle branch block, he becomes again eligible for CRT. They work very well because the problem is an underlying advanced conduction disease. So that is the importance of recognizing masquerading bundle branch block. It's very easy to say, okay, uh, this is a red bundle branch block, left antifascicular block, nothing to worry. And you can send him home. But uh, this is the, you have to uh, go for a permanent pacemaker insertion, even if the patient is asymptomatic. So you are, when he came one year, one, one week back itself, this was screaming that I am a severe disease, but uh, it was not really recognized. Because it was not recognized, they left it and this patient came. So when he came, you can see here, it has become an advanced disease. So it has become a 2 is to an AV block along with a uh, QRS uh, prolongation. So it is more like an infranodal block. So this is again an indication for permanent pacemaker insertion. So we saw that it has an independent high mortality. So what happened to this patient was, this patient came, we put in a permanent pacemaker insertion. Even with that, in hospital, he developed a sudden arrhythmia and heart failure worsened and he, we could not save him. So that is why you recognize this early, you can treat them early. So you can at least prevent these complications. Because most of them, they end up having a triple ozone disease on the angio. Even before you could do the angio, we could not really save him. Uh, so that's why it's very, very crucial uh, to look for this. Whenever you have an RSR dash, look carefully for this wave. If S wave is not there, be even more cautious and say, no, you push, you have to push. Because many times, no one can read the ECG for you other than yourself. No one else can be the master of the ECG other than yourself. You have to train yourself for that. So I hope this was useful. Um, so we'll see we'll, if you have any other interesting ECGs, you can send it across. So hope it was useful. We'll meet you next week with another interesting ECG. Thank you.